just left and said you need to wear this. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to this service of worship on uh, first Sunday in October, but more importantly, it's World Communion Sunday today, and we're reminded that Christians throughout the world are celebrating communion, and, and though we worship in different ways, with different experiences, we're united in one faith. Uh, the children of our Sunday school have made this uh, uh, stole, with has the hands hands of many different colors uh, today for us to wear and just a reminder that we are united in our faith in Christ with people throughout all the world. We are delighted you're here today. We invite you to please sign the friendship rosters that are found on each pew and pass them along. Be sure you get uh, acquainted with anyone you may not already, uh, already know. Uh, on November 1st, we'll be doing our third annual Men on a Mission. This is a really a wonderful evening of fellowship uh, where 30 men uh, serve as cooks uh, with a variety of foodstuffs in Fellowship Hall. And uh, it's just a lot, of, uh, a lot of fun, a lot of exchange of uh, good laughter and good eating. And uh, it is all for the benefit of Watts, our Winchester Area Temporary Thermal Shelter. There are only 300 tickets available. Each church has been given a certain number of them, and so we invite you to pick up tickets afterward if you haven't already uh, picked them up. We are uh, doing uh, today, it is communion, as you see, and all of the bread uh, is gluten-free today, if that's a, a need that you have, just so you're aware, aware of that. Uh, this Tuesday, we'll begin uh, restoration of a, of a ministry we've had at various times in the life of our church, a visitation team. Uh, those of you who may be interested in doing a little visiting to folks who are shut in, who are unable to get out on a regular basis, I'd invite you to come. We'll have a very light lunch in, in uh, Fellowship Hall and invite you then to uh, talk a little bit about helping uh, establish this ministry in the life of our congregation. Um, I meant to bring the rose in from the other, the other place. There, there was a new birth in the church family. The rose was in, in New Stone this morning. Uh, the, the birth of Kinsey Virginia Feltner, uh, Josh and Stephanie's uh, new daughter, and Barry and, uh, and uh, Debbie Carper's uh, granddaughter. So we welcome, welcome her. I want to give thanks to Dave Foster, who's been filling in for two weeks for Pat Byers while she's been on vacation, and we're really grateful for uh, his musical leadership. Next week uh, at this service, at, at all the services, uh, we'll be having visitors from our partner churches in church in Guatemala. There are five women who have been part of the Faith Stories Project and who have been part of the Health Post uh, ministry there that will be with us. Um, and they will be helping to lead in worship. They'll be doing some dramas uh, that they've been working on. And uh, I think it'll be a very interesting service for there. Most of these women, uh, the Presbyterian Church in Guatemala, most of these women, uh, Spanish isn't their first language. It is one of the native uh, languages, uh, Quiche or one of the other, other tongues. So uh, anyway, you, you have a chance to kind of meet them. And there is a lunch following the service. It's going to be in Fellowship Hall. The lunch is no cost for the lunch. If you'd like to have a chance to meet these women in a more personal way, uh, plan to stay for that. There will be a translator for each of the women. So uh, in case you don't know Quiche, <laughs> let alone Spanish, right? Uh, you, you'll be able to communicate that, that way. So are there other announcements that need to be made today? 
If not, then let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship the living God. Oh, uh, one, I do have one other thing, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, nominating committee. Uh, this uh, week the nominating committee will be meeting and we, both last week and this week we've been inviting you to make suggestions to the churchwide nominating committee for elders and trustee uh, for them to consider. So if you have somebody in mind you think would be a, a good leader in this church, uh, please uh, fill out one of those recommendation forms. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship. Oh, the bell, bell choir. That's right. There, there's an error in the bulletin about the bell choir. Uh, it says 6 o'clock, the bell will, bells will be meeting for the first time. It's actually 7 o'clock they're meeting tomorrow. So those of you in bell choir, 7 o'clock. Right, thanks.
Let us join in the responsive call to worship. Let the mind of Christ be in us. Let the spirit of Christ be with us. One spirit, one body, one love. Let us pray. O God, who dwells in high, inaccessible places of light, and yet also in the hearts of those who are humble and lowly, we turn to you in prayer. You have not left us to ourselves and our own devices. You have given us your word to enlighten us, your church to encourage us, your daily presence standing by us in all of life's circumstances. Continue to stand by us, O God, that we might leave from this place and this time of worship more ready to face the many great challenges and the many tough decisions that are ours. Give us your assurance that we journey not alone and that in all circumstances in life, you stand beside us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray together. Sovereign God, God we, we confess, confess that, that we are, are not ready for, for your, your holy, holy realm. realm. You gave us the gift of your law, but we do, we do not, not keep, keep your, your commandments. commandments. You sent your Son to save us, but we sent him to death. Forgive us, merciful God, so that we may return to your fold and rejoice in your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lamb upon the throne. Amen.
Amen. Hear now the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, and the old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And so, friends, believe this good news in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. I would invite any of the uh, elementary age children or younger to come forward now for the children's time with Todd. Good morning. Um, today is a special day, as we, as you notice, as you came up. Um, there's a special table set up in front of us, um, and then on on our bulletin, um, we see a picture of the cup and the bread. Um, so later in the service, we will be sharing a special meal and juice, a special bread and juice, um, to remember Jesus and to remember Jesus' great love for us. And so as we share the bread and the juice, we can remember that Jesus died for us and that Jesus loves us. And we can remember that even when we do wrong, Jesus will forgive us. Um, so sometimes when we have communion, um, I like to, if there's special music, I like to sit and, uh, and listen to the music. Sometimes when we have communion, I'll, I'll sit in my seat and I'll bow my head and I'll say a silent prayer to God. Um, and sometimes I like to look around. Um, and there's some, a, a thing that I've noticed and, and something that I've learned as I've looked around the congregation as, as we have communion. Um, I, sometimes as I look around, I'm reminded of just how much Jesus loves every person who, who is here and who receives communion. Um, so much that Jesus even died for them. And so every single person I see, I, I, as I look around and I see each person take the bread and take the, um, take the juice, I'm reminded um, that they are, are doing the same thing I am, remembering that Jesus died for them. So what I'd like you to do, and I want you to help me, I want you to look out and see all of their faces, and I want you to say something um, with me. So on the, on the count of three, I want us to say, Jesus died for you. All right, can you guys do that? Let's look out. It's a one, two, three. Jesus died for you. And congregation, can you say that back to us on the count of three? One, two, three. Jesus died for you. All right. And so, um, and can we all together say, Jesus died for me? So on three, one, two, three. Jesus, Jesus died, died for me. me. Um, so indeed, there is no greater love than the love that Jesus has for each of us. And so we remember it as we celebrate communion, um, and we remember it as we remind each other um, about Jesus' love and how he died for us. Well, today is also not just a day that we celebrate communion um, here at, at First Presbyterian Church, uh, but a day called World Communion Sunday when people all over the world are, are, are celebrating Holy Communion also. So it's a special day that we set apart and we encourage churches all over the world to do it on the same day um, to remind us um, that Jesus died, not just for the people that we see with our eyes um, here with us today, but for, for God's people all over the world, all right? Um, 
So kids, if you would join me in a word of prayer and congregation, if you would join along with us. Dear God, Dear God thank you for your great love. Thank you for your great love. For us all. For us all. We thank you. We thank you. For the special meal of Holy Communion. That will be celebrated today by people all over the world. Amen. All right. Thank you all for joining me this morning. Hey, you may go back to your folks or after we ones worship. And as uh, we spend a moment greeting each other, uh, ushers are going to be handing out to you information about our uh, peacemaking offering, which we always receive on World Communion Service. So. Uh, but anyway, spend a moment greeting each other in the name of the Lord. And then when we come back together, we invite you to sing together, We Are Called. Our sermon series throughout this year is uh, The World God is Building, a uh, fresh look at the kingdom of God. And it's very interesting that Jesus, in, in uh, many places, when he talks about the sacrament, when he initiates the sacrament, he talks in this kingdom language, that this is the feast of the, of the people of the kingdom of God. And he talks about anticipating a, a heavenly banquet in the, in, when the fullness of the kingdom comes. And so we focus on this theme today, eating and drinking in the kingdom. And our text is uh, Luke's version of the uh, words of institution, of, in of Jesus instituting communion. So listen now to God's word. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying... This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. 
But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at table or the one who serves? It is, not, is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You are those who have stood by me. And I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me, a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom. I think it's rather striking that during the Last Supper, Jesus' disciples get into an argument about which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. In Matthew's Gospel, it is the ambitious mother of James and John who buttonholes Jesus about whether he will do right by her sons and find them a special place of power in his coming kingdom. But in Luke's Gospel, it is the disciples themselves that get into this argument about who is the greatest. It's so human, isn't it? All this talk of kingdom gets them speculating about who is going to wield the power, have the authority, get to exercise control when Jesus' kingdom comes. Now, of course, Jesus quickly straightens them out by offering a stern corrective to any self-centered delusions of greatness they might have. The greatest of you must become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. After all, Jesus says, I am with you as one who serves. Now, Jesus is not ignorant that the kingdoms of this world run by power and control, but he is initiating a kingdom of another sort. I confer on you, he says, just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom, but you will need to recognize that this kingdom is built on power and authority of a different kind. This kingdom is shaped by beatitude values, as we talked about last week. This kingdom is characterized by transformed life and a spirit of forgiveness and an attitude of compassion and grace and, above all, love. There is real authority in the gospel. It's just not the kind we have come to expect. Kingdom, as the world's rulers view it, always seems to involve coercive power, a desire to control things my way. But kingdom, as Jesus understands it, operates on different principles. Kingdom living does not mean abrogating authority, but the authority of kingdom dwellers is not coercive. Rather, it's the authority of a gardener, say, who skillfully attends to the needs of living things, providing appropriate conditions to causing life to flourish, sometimes pruning when necessary, but always directed toward facilitating the growth that is envisioned by the gardener. Those who celebrate this sacred meal that I have just initiated, Jesus tells us in this text, those who come together to eat and drink are those who have received and who have welcomed this new kingdom rule that has been conferred. The table is the feast of the kingdom. And coming to this table is a sign that we place ourselves under the authority of God's reign. Those who come to the table are those who want to be shaped by a servant's heart as big and bold and welcoming and inclusive as the heart of Jesus. 
Consider the traditional invitation to communion. It goes something like this. All you who repent and are in love with your neighbors and intend to lead a new way of life and walk in God's holy ways, come. We are to come with the intent to trust Jesus and to follow him in how we conduct our life and to live according to the norms of the kingdom he has come to initiate. But because this kingdom is not fully present, this table also looks forward. It anticipates the messianic banquet that he talks about, when people shall come from north and south and east and west and eat at the kingdom of God in its fullness. Coming to the table, therefore, is both an acknowledgement of our present imperfection, but also of our future hope. If God's kingdom is conferred on us, and this table is a sign of that reality, then the question of who gets a place at this table is a very important one. I'm wondering how your family table was configured in your growing up years when you would have your big family celebrations. You know, was it anything like this? Did you, did you ever experience in your growing up years the children's table? You know, uh, you know what I mean probably. The kids were often relegated uh, off to a side table probably a, a card table, you know, with cousins of all ages. You got stuck as a 12-year-old with your three-year-old cousin and, and all the rest there. After all, I guess the idea is we might spill things. We might interrupt adult conversation. We might get bored by it. And somehow I got the idea that I wasn't worthy of the big table, much as I yearned for that time when I could be fully part of the family you know, participate even in conversation that I didn't yet fully understand. Part of the reason a generation ago the church changed its practice and began inviting children to come to the table was the conviction was that it was in being welcomed to the big table, you know, that children would begin to know what it was to live as kingdom people from a very early age. We want a table that is as welcoming as the heart of Jesus. But we are not yet there. We know that there are traditions which don't believe that we can commune, can commune with those unless we hold the same views, if they have differing views on the meaning of the sacraments. One of the sad things which still divides Catholics and Protestants, of course. And even on World Communion Sunday, when we affirm a Christianity that is far more diverse than what we experience, we are conscious of ethnic and cultural practices that divide us as Christians. We have our ideas about who is worthy to sit at this table and let economic and social and racial and theological divisions mask our common unity as sinners redeemed by the grace of God called to be the hands and feet of Jesus in service to others. Coming to the table is a sign of our conviction that the kingdom has been conferred upon us, but we have not yet fully realized its full expression. Do you remember the Academy Award winning film Places in the Heart, of probably 20 years ago now, with Sally Field and John Malkovich and uh, Kevin Spacey and Danny Glover and a whole host of other luminaries are in it. It concludes with one of the most moving scenes in all of filmdom. It's a communion scene. And uh, you know, you can get anything on YouTube now. So just uh, you know, go to YouTube, Places in the Heart, Communion, and uh, you'll be able to see this about four minute scene. It never fails to move me. I, I looked at it again this week in preparation for this. And the movie is set during the Depression. And it's a story of a young woman, you know, played by Field, whose husband has been tragically murdered, leaving her to raise her two children alone. Her small family farm is on the verge of being foreclosed by several rather cold-hearted bankers, and she gets help from a, a blind, troubled misfit played by Malkovich. And in the movie, there are scenes of human cruelty and greed and 
harsh judgments and racism, um, and you know, punctuated occasionally by acts of sacrifice and kindness and life itself. In some ways, the movie presents a rather troubling view of humanity in all its ugliness, but then it ends with this most remarkable depiction of hope and redemption. The final scene takes place in a small country church as they celebrate the sacrament of communion. The choir is singing that great old song, In the Garden, and you see several trays of, of, of uh, bread and wine being passed among them, and initially you only see the hands that are being passed back and forth, person to person, but lovingly the people eat and drink. And although at first there seems to be just a few people in the church, as the scene progresses, the camera pulls back, and you realize there in the church, sharing the loaf and the cup, are not only the living, but also those who have died, and also others in the community from whom the main characters have been estranged throughout the years. You see the husband who had been murdered and his now dead murderer. You see a, a black man and the, the men who have bullied him. You've seen the wife and the bankers who would have had her thrown off the farm. And then you realize you know that this is not really a, a church service you are seeing. It is the heavenly banquet, the communion of saints. It's eating and drinking in the kingdom of God at a table where the welcome of Jesus is broad and expansive and has now transcended all the hatreds and divisions and fears and angers and resentments which have marred humanity. It is the community the better angels of our souls desire. It's the kingdom table promised by God and for which at, we best, at our best we strive to embody but which we now experience only imperfectly. We come to this table today on World Communion Sunday as a sign that God has conferred his kingdom on us. Can we imagine as we eat and drink, not the fragmented table we sometimes experience now, but the heavenly banquet whose vision God places before us? Can we imagine sitting beside those cloud of witnesses who have gone before us and who call us to greater faithfulness? Can we imagine sitting beside family members whose behavior is troubling us or for whom we have become estranged? Can we imagine sitting beside those with whom we differ or who cause us fear? Can we imagine sitting beside those whose way of doing church is so different than our own that we are not permitted to share communion? Can we imagine that we are sitting beside brothers and sisters in Christ from Guatemala and Ethiopia and Bangladesh and Iraq? Can we imagine sitting beside those who we didn't imagine would be at the table? If we can, then we've begun to be grasped by the call of God's kingdom and know that our eating and drinking is drawing us into a community where God reigns and whose beauty and harmony we can only now dare to envision. Thanks be to God who gives us this victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Remembering the words of our Lord Jesus that it is more blessed to give than to receive, let us now return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. We invite you now to come to the table of the Lord. Come to the table of company with Jesus and all who love him. It is the table of sharing with the poor of the world with whom Jesus identified himself. Come to this table, those of you who have much faith and those of you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been here for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who are struggling to follow. Come. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share this feast that he has prepared. Our communion hymn is 516, Lord, we have come at your own invitation. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. And then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. 
You are holy, God of majesty and blessed. Is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord? In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick and fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and needy. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, we ask that you would pour your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O oh God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. This day, O oh Lord, we ask that you would remember your church, united in truth, and empower it for ministry in the world. We ask that you would remember the world of nations. By your spirit, renew the face of the earth. Let peace and justice prevail. Remember, O oh God, our family and friends. Bless them and watch over them. Be gracious to them and give them peace. Remember, O oh Lord, the sick and the suffering. Especially this day, we pray for Kerrigan we pray for Dale Barley. We pray for Gary Wake. And we pray for Gary Belcher. Encourage them and give them hope. Bring healing as a sign of your grace. Rejoicing in the communion of saints, we remember with thanksgiving all your faithful servants and those dear to us whom you have called from this life. Remembering especially this day the father of Lynn McCauley, and the family and friends of Chichi Kern. We are grateful that for them death is no more, nor is there sorrow, crying, or pain for the former things have passed away. O oh God, we ask that you would keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin, and often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. Ministering to you in his name, I invite you to receive the bread. 